All right, so we're going to take a look. Um, still on section 8.5 in your textbook, but remember now we're in the um, second packet. In the packet, I think it's, um, is it 5.5? Five, five? Yeah. 5.5. Five. Mm -hmm. It's the dot product. The dot product. Yeah. All right, so we've done a lot of different operations with vectors. We've added them, we've subtracted them, both visually and with numbers. We've scaled them visually and just doing it with numbers. Um, now we're going to look at what's called a dot product. So a dot product is a way to take two vectors and multiply them. And if you're thinking, well, didn't we kind of do that with a scalar product? No. This is a number times a vector. A number in front times a vector. What we're going to look at today is a vector. times a vector. How do we multiply two vectors together? Uh, so first thing we got to figure out is how do you do it? And the second thing is, what do you get for an answer? Is the answer just a number? Or is the answer a new vector? Okay. So we'll, we'll see what happens. All right, so suppose we had two vectors in the column V and W. Each vector would have a horizontal component, and each vector would have a vertical component. All the A's and B's would be numbers. Okay, like I'll just I'll come right back to that. But something like uh, like that. You'll have actual numbers in the problem. All right. So to find the dot product between those two those two vectors. I'm going to show you the formula. Okay. First of all, just again to say this, A1, A2, B1, and B2 are all numbers. Positives, negatives, fractions, or decimals. Doesn't matter. So the dot product, first of all, the symbol, very creatively, is a dot. I'll explain why you cannot put this. You cannot just put the V and the W right next to each other without the dot between them. I know in algebra you can. You can put a number next to something without a dot, and it means 3 times x. But with vectors, you have to put the dot in there. I'll tell you why in a minute. Okay, so to find the dot product, the first thing you do is take a1, which is right here, take A2, which is right there, multiply them together. Okay. Then you're going to add B1 times B2. So you're going to take that, you're going to take that, multiply them together, and add them. So Let's kind of go through this and see what our answer would be. A1 is a number. A2 is a number. What do you get when you multiply a number times a number? Another number. Another number. B1 is a number. B2 is a number. So when you multiply the Bs together, a number times some other number is another number. What if you add a number to a number? Get another number. Get another number. So the answer here, when you do a dot product, is a number. 12, negative 17, whatever it comes out to. The dot product comes out to a number. Number for answer. Okay, so here's an example. In this problem, v is 2i minus 3j. That's like my a1 and b1. W is 5i plus 3j. That's my a2 and my b2. And the directions here are to find v dot w. That's how you pronounce it. We don't say times with vectors. The reason we don't say times is because with vectors, there's two ways to find a product. There's what's called the dot product, which I'm teaching you right now. And then there's something else called a cross product. 
which we might look at tomorrow. If you said to me, I want you to multiply vector v times w, I'd say I don't know what you mean. When you say v times w, do you want me to do a dot product, or do you want me to do a um, cross product? Great. You'll know if something is a cross product because it would be written like this. When you do a cross product, they put an x between the two vectors. That's why I said you have to put something between the two vectors, either a dot or a cross. Don't worry about cross products for today. Okay, we're going to stick with dot product. So let's go through and, and see if we can find um, the dot product. Um, so, Myrie, what are going to be the first two numbers I multiply together? A1 and A2, which in my problem are 2 and 5. So we're going to do 2 times 5 plus, uh, and Casey, the next next two numbers? Um, yep, yeah, negative 3 and 3. 2 times 5 is going to give me 10. Negative 3 times 3 is negative 9. So what's the dot product of V and W? One. one. <coughs> now, what does that really mean, that the dot product is a 1? Um, it, it has to do with something. Uh -huh. But, well, remember, that's not a length. It's just a number. In this case, it's not the length of it. Yeah, it's just a coincidence. It came out to 1. <laughs> I'll explain later what we would use that 1 for. Let's try w dot v. If I do w dot v, what are going to be the two numbers I multiply together first in the order I should do it? It should be 5 times 2. should be 5 times 2 this time. Plus... 3 times negative 3. But is there a difference? No. We get the same dot product. So what does that mean? If v dot w, w dot v gives you the same answer. They're the same thing. They're the same thing, so the dot product is, is a word for it. You even remember what that means? A unit vector? Not a unit vector, it begins with a C. Commutative. Yes. The dot product is commutative. But the test, on the test, you will be put commutative or will you put one? Or one is commutative? What's that? I'm not sure what you're asking. So this, these are calculations, right? So these are like a numerical calculation. This is a fact about the dot product. I'm just telling you the dot product obeys the property of commutativity. All right, so switching the order when you do a dot product doesn't make a difference. Question on it? Is there ever a case where it does make a difference? No. 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 The dot product is always commutative. The cross product isn't. Oh. Yeah. Okay. So when we do when we do cross product, it's probably the first time you've ever seen when you do multiplication, if you switch the order, you get a different answer. Okay, we'll talk more about that tomorrow. Uh, three, yeah, that's right. Okay. Um, let's do V dot V. So we're dotting v with it with itself. So that should be two times two. Times should be two times two plus negative three times negative three. So two times two plus negative three times negative three. Another way to say two times two is so if you do it out, it's four <laughs> or two squared. Um, so we get four plus nine which is 13. 
Now, I want you to think of it as saying it squared for a second and see if it looks like something else. 2 squared plus negative 3 squared. Almost like doing the Pythagorean theorem, but you didn't do one thing. What, what, we didn't square root it. When you dot a vector with itself, you get 2 squared plus negative 3 squared. So it's almost like finding the magnitude, but you didn't take the square root. Okay. Let's try that again with w and see if that works. Um, how would you do w dot w? 5 times 5 plus 3 times 3. Yeah, it would be 5 squared plus 3 squared, which is almost finding the magnitude. The only step you didn't do was take the square root. So that is really the magnitude squared. If you wanted to know the real magnitude, you should take the square root of that. Oh, so all you really need to do is find square roots and then just square root. magnitude. Yeah, it's, a, it's like finding the magnitude, just you're not doing the square root. Just a, something that comes up when you dot a vector with itself. Okay, and I'm going to summarize that right here. If you dot a vector with itself, you don't get the magnitude because you didn't square root it. You get the magnitude squared. Okay, same thing here. If you dot w with itself, you don't get the magnitude. Okay, you don't get magnitude of w because you didn't take the square root. You get the magnitude squared. So even though we're doing a dot product, which is it's a new name, something I never mentioned before, the calculations built into it are very similar to stuff we've done in the past. Let's try this one. So I'm dotting um, the vector 2, 6 with the vector 0, 0. What would I get here? Zero. 0 the number or 0 the vector? 0 the number. Zero the number. Whenever you find a dot product, the answer is a number. It's 2 times 0 plus 6 times 0. That's the number 0 plus the number 0, which is the number 0, not the vector 0. Okay, whenever you do a dot product, the answer is a number. It's never a vector. Never. Okay. The fact that the dot product came out to 0, that means something special. Okay, we'll talk more about when you get a zero dot product. What does that mean? Any questions on how we got the dot product there? Okay. So the distributed per property works with the dot product, and it works exactly like you would think it would. If you want to dot a vector with a sum of two vectors, it's u dot v plus u dot w. Okay, and you might think, well, yeah, isn't that just a distributive property? Yes, but we can't assume, because now we're learning what a dot product is, you can't assume that the distributive property you know works. It does, but we can't assume that everything we know still works. So what that basically does is it gives you options. If you had a problem, you could add the vectors first, okay, following order of operations, and then do a dot product. Or if you didn't want to add them first, you could do the dot product with the first one, then do the dot product with the second one, and then add the result. You can do it either way. Any question on that? Kind of like if you had this, one way you could do it is 3 plus 2 is 6, 6 times 2 is 12, adding what's inside first. Or if you add a distribute first, you could do that. 2 times 3 is 6. Um, if you do your arithmetic right, that always works good. 
3 plus 2 is 5, not 6. So 2 times 3 is 6. 2 times 2 is 4. I get the same answer whether I add first or distribute first. Okay? Works just like that with vectors. All right, so what we really use the dot product for is to find the angle between two vectors. Okay, so if you imagine, um, I've got something like this, something like that. I'm trying to find the angle made between the two vectors. Technically, there's two angles. There's the one on the inside, and there's also the one on the outside. We're finding the inside. Okay, we're finding the the smaller one, the one that's less than 180. Okay, and to find the angle between two vectors, it's going to involve um, three things. All calculations we've done before. First thing you need to find is the dot product. The next thing you need to find is the length of the first vector and the length of the second. Once you know those three things, dot product, length of the first, length of the second, you fill them into this formula. Cosine theta equals the dot product over the product of the magnitudes. Okay, so if you forget what that double bars mean again, the denominator, those double bars mean magnitude or length. Now you notice there's a cosine in there. So in order to prove where that formula comes from, um, the proof involves the law of cosines. So when you use this formula, you're really using law of cosines. Okay, and that's what we did. That was in section 8.2. I think that was that was on the take-home test. Okay, but for us, we don't go through the proof, we just use the result to do some calculations. Questions on what that formula says? Not how to use it, because we're going to do that right now, but just how to read it. Okay. So let's look at this one. So I've got two vectors, and I want to find the angle between them. I will tell you that most of the time, the angle is not a nice number. It's usually, usually a decimal. So to find the angle between the two vectors, what's the first thing I said you need to find? The dot, the dot product. So let's start with the dot product. Um, Mike, can you tell me my um, calculation to find the dot product? Dot uh, product would be um, 4 times 2 and negative 3 times 5. And negative 3 times 5. So that's going to give me 8 minus 15, which is? Negative 7. Okay, so there's the first thing we need. We've got the dot product. Um, what's the next thing I need? I need the magnitude. So let's do the magnitude of u. I'll just start out with my square root. Uh, and Matt, what's going to be my um, calculation to find the magnitude of u? How are we going to find the magnitude of u? Four squared and three squared. Yeah, so we're going to do four squared plus negative three squared. Okay, whether or not you include the negative when you square, it really doesn't make a difference because the negative is just going to cancel out. Uh, and Brandon, what's four squared? Four squared is 
and negative 3 squared? Is that what your calculator told you? Yeah, I did the whole thing. Careful. When you type in negative 3 squared, if you type it in on a calculator, you can't type it in like this. Because it will tell you negative 9, and that is wrong. What it, how come it's wrong the way I typed it in? So this is just something that's actually a good point to be careful of when you type it in. You have to put parentheses so it includes the negative sign. Exactly. Exactly what she just said. You've got to put parentheses so it includes the negative. So 16 plus 9 gives you square root of 25. Square root of 25, 5. Okay, so we got the dot product. We get the length of u. <coughs> Last thing I need. Magnitude of e. Square root of 4 squared plus 5 squared. Um, wait a minute. 2 squared, which is going to be 4. 2 squared plus 5 squared. 4 plus, nine, uh, 4 plus 5 gives me 29. 4 plus 5 squared. Um, just leave it as the square root of 29. Any questions on how we found the three things? Great. We just type them in. Cosine of theta equals the dot product over the product of the magnitudes. So the dot product is negative 7. And the product of the magnitudes, 5 square root 29. Okay. Now that's not theta. That's not the angle. That's the cosine of the angle. So how am I going to get rid of cosine? Yes. Exactly. I'm going to take the inverse cosine of what's on the left and do the same thing on the right. Type that in, and that is the answer. So it's the inverse cosine of negative 7 over 5 root 29. Um, this is another one that if you're going to type it in all at once, just be careful with parentheses. So I'm going to open a parenthesis for um, the denominator. 5 square root 29. Okay, I'm going to close the denominator, and then I'm going to close the inverse cosine. Um, oh, yeah, you need to put in the division sign. That helps. I think I said I'm going to open the parentheses for the denominator, but I never made it the denominator. So negative 7 divided by, now, now we're good. 105.07 degrees. That's the angle between the vectors. Questions on that? Let me, um, let me sketch the two vectors and see if that looks reasonable. So we've got the vector 4, negative 3. So right 4, down 3. Okay, so roughly pretty close. And then the other vector was 2, 5. 2, 5. The angle that we just found <coughs> is right there. Uh, and I would say it does look a little bit bigger than 90, not, not too big. Uh, so 105 seems, seems reasonable. Okay. Any questions on that? So another um, special word that can come up, but it really means the same as something you already know. If the two vectors are perpendicular, okay, they meet at a 90 degree angle. And when we talk about vectors, they call that orthogonal. Okay, so it's just another word for perpendicular. So if I ask you a question on the test, are these two vectors orthogonal? All I'm asking, are these two vectors perpendicular? Why do you use that term with vectors? We talked about that yesterday with another um, teacher a little bit. And I'm not sure. To 
confusion. So what did I just say a second ago? If two vectors are perpendicular, that means the angle between them would be 90. Okay. Let's see what happens when the angle is 90. There's, there's a shortcut to figure that out. Let's me, um, I can leave that up. So let's say I'm giving you a problem, and we already know that they're perpendicular. Let's fill in 90 for the angle. Doesn't matter what's on the other side. Okay, pretend that we have a dot product on the top, product of magnitudes on the bottom. Okay, but the angle is 90. Let's take the cosine of 90 and see what we get. Get zero. Zero equals something over something. So right now, I have a fraction equal to 0. What's the only way that a fraction can ever equal 0? If what? If the numerator is 0. If the numerator is 0. That's the only way a fraction will equal 0, if the top is 0. What's in the top? I, mean, I know it's a squiggly line here, but when we do our formula, what's normally in the top? The dot product. The dot product. So, if the dot product comes out to zero, then you know your vectors are perpendicular. You don't have to do any more work. Because if the dot product comes out to zero, you're going to have zero divided by something. Doesn't matter. Zero divided by anything comes out to zero. If that side comes out to zero, the angle has to be 90. There's no other number you can take the cosine of and get zero. It's got to be known. Okay, so now that's similar to a question you see on the test. Are these vectors perpendicular? Okay, that's the symbol for perpendicular, just an upside down T. Another way I could ask this question is I could give you a vector and say which of the following give you three choices. You pick which one is the perpendicular one. There would be one correct choice. Something like that. Okay, so let's find our dot product. Um, and if these are perpendicular, we're going to hope that the dot product comes out to zero. If it does, then they're perpendicular. If it doesn't, then the angle is not 90, but the question isn't asking what the angle would be. This is just yes or no. Um, all right, so for V, I've got a 2. But what number is in front of I for W? 1. one. So it's 2 times 1 plus 1 times 2. Does that come out to 0? No, it comes out to 4. So what's the angle between the vectors? I don't know. I'd have to keep going and use the formula, but I know it's not 90. So these are not perpendicular. Four divided by anything will never equal zero. I don't care if you take four dollars and split it between a million people. Everyone's still going to get something. They're not going to get zero. Um, what could you change here to make the dot product zero? You could just change one thing. Yeah? Just change any number there to a negative. Any one of them. The two, the one, the one, or the other two. If you make any one of them a negative, then you would force the vectors to be orthogonal. Okay. So questions on that? All right. Um, Actually, before we do the word problem, let's look at one more thing. Let's look at parallel. So parallel, there's two situations that can happen. These are parallel, and the angle between them is 0. And these are also parallel. And the angle between those is 180. 
So parallel can be two vectors on like almost right on top of each other that point the same way, or two vectors that point in opposite directions. Either way, these vectors would never cross each other. And if they don't cross, they're parallel. Let's look and see, um, see if we can come up with a shortcut um, for parallel. Okay, let's look at the first case, where the angle is 0. So pretend on the top we have a dot product, on the bottom a product of magnitudes, and the angle somehow comes out to 0. Well, if the angle is 0, that means the left-hand side would come out to 1. Okay, would come out to 1. How can a fraction come out to 1? What has to happen? They just have to be equal, yes. Unfortunately, when she said they both have to be equal, well, since she used the word both, that means you need to know this and you need to know that. You have to know both. So there's not as much of a shortcut here. But if the top and the bottom come out the same, the dot product and the product in magnitudes, they are parallel. Um, let's look at the case where it's 180. Just trust me on it. When you type in cosine 180, you get negative 1. What's the only way that a fraction can come out to negative 1? OK, they'll have to be a negative in either the top or the bottom. And what else to make it always negative 1, not negative 2 or anything else? Yep. Yeah? Right. The numbers have to be opposites. So when you find your dot product and the product of the magnitudes, if they come out the same or they come out opposites, you're parallel. Mm -hmm. But you still have to find everything. Hey, so let's look at these two vectors. I want to determine if they are parallel. <coughs> Start with our um, dot product. Um, why, what's 4 times 20? 80. Plus negative 5 times negative 25 gives me Yep, think of like five quarters, 1.25, $1.25, so 125. Add them up. There's our dot product, 205. Okay. Length of V, 16 plus 25. Um, what's 16 plus 25? 40, square root of 41. So there's the length of V. Last thing I need to figure out if these are parallel is the length of W. 20 squared is 400. Negative 25 squared, 625. What's 400 plus 625? 1,025. So let's write our fraction down and see if the dot product comes out the same as the product of these two numbers, or does it come out opposite? I don't even need to really write out the whole formula, because if it doesn't come out the same or opposite, I'm not going to figure out what it is. Just yes or no is the answer to this question. Dot product over the product of the magnitudes. Let's do the square root of 41 times the square root of 1,025. Again, 
205. And what's 205 divided by 205? One. one. So the fraction just came out to one. If you forgot that, oh yeah, they're parallel, like we should know that at this point, but if you forgot it, how would you get rid of cosine? Take the inverse cosine of one, you get an angle of zero degrees. If you scroll back up, an angle of zero degrees means they're parallel. Hopefully you wouldn't have to go through inverse cosine. You should already know they're parallel at that step right there. All right, so what was the question? Was it um, determine if these are parallel? Yes. Yes, they are. So any question on that? All right, so the last thing we're going to do, um, to be our last problem for today, is the word problem. Don't get um, wrapped up with like the type of plane, or that doesn't really matter. All that really matters here are the numbers for how fast the plane is going and the speed of the wind. I also have to describe to you when they word it in a word problem, what it means if they say the direction is coming, if the wind is coming from the east or blowing towards the east. There's a difference in the wording. You have to know which way the wind is blowing depending on how they word it. So our airplane is maintaining an airspeed of 500 miles an hour. Um, the other thing I probably should mention too is the difference between airspeed and ground speed. Um, I know one person knows the difference. Um, so if you're not sure what airspeed and ground speed is, the easy way to kind of think about it is if you're in your car, going down the highway, say 50 miles an hour, you put your hand out the window, and the air, and say there's no window. So somebody that's standing on the highway, they don't feel any breeze at all. If you put your hand out the window and your speedometer says 50, how fast is the wind hitting your hand? At 50 miles an hour. At 50 miles an hour. Now, let's say same kind of situation, except somebody standing on the highway standing still, they feel a breeze of 20 miles an hour. And you're driving into the breeze, so it's hitting the front, it's hitting your windshield. You're going down the highway, your speedometer says 50. See? Your car is going the same speed, but you put your hand out the window now. How fast is the wind hitting you? Wait, hand? is the wind hitting you this way? It's a headwind. At 30 miles per hour? Uh, I think I said the wind was blowing 20, and you're driving 50. So how 70. fast would it? The wind would be hitting your hand at 70. That's the air speed. So air speed is the speed that the air is moving over the object. Ground speed is kind of like what your speedometer says. Okay, that's the difference. Okay, this particular plane, I'm trying to make it a simple problem, is flying south. Because what we have to do is turn this information into a velocity vector. Something with an I component, something with a J component. So we did that yesterday. Um, they didn't give you an angle, but they told you south. So you should be able to figure out what south means as an angle based on how we number our axes all the time. Okay, so we'll, we'll get back to that. Um, the jet stream, okay, the wind is blowing 80 miles per hour exactly north and east. So it's exactly halfway between north and east. So the question is, find out how fast the plane is actually going, and then tell me the direction the plane is going to be going. If you combine the two forces together, the plane wants to go south, the wind is going to blow, so maybe it's going to blow it off track a little bit. Okay, I'm going to set this up as kind of a, a visual first, so we can see the vector that represents the wind, the vector that represents the plane, and then I'll draw in what would actually happen when you combine the effect of the wind and the plane together. And that's what we're interested in, the combined effect. Okay, 
Does everybody have what they need written before I scroll up to the diagram? Okay. So here's, here's our diagram. I'm going to draw three arrows on it. The first one is going to be a vector that represents the plane. Um, the plane is going south. Okay, just to make sure everybody knows the directions. Those are the directions. North, south, east, west. So the plane is going south at 500 miles an hour. Also, what I'm sketching right now is not to scale. So we have a plane going south. Uh, let's see, if I make it a little thicker, you should be able to see the arrowhead. And if I change the color, Let's call that um, V sub P. It's the velocity of the, it's the vector for the plane. Okay, vector for the plane. Okay, the next thing is I have the wind. Okay, jet stream is just wind. So the wind is blowing 80 miles per hour northeast. Well, if this is east and that's north, it's exactly halfway between north and east. Okay, but I'm going to draw it a little shorter because the speed of the wind is only 80. The speed of the plane is 500. So the wind speed, it shouldn't look like it's as long of an arrow. Right, so let's draw it out. Put it like that. Okay, I'll keep that one black. And we'll call that V sub W. That's the vector for the wind. Now, if I wanted to know what the combined effect is going to be, okay, we've done this before. All I would do, and I'm going to erase this in a second, I just need it temporarily, is I would put the vector for the wind onto the end of the plane and then connect where I started to where I finished. And let's put this one in green. So what you're looking at in green is what is actually going to happen. The wind is blowing northeast. It's going to slow the plane down. Notice the green arrow is shorter than the red one. It's going to slow down a little bit. And it's going to blow the plane off course. So the plane wants to go south. But the plane is actually going to end up going not exactly south and east, but it's going to end up going more east unless the pilot corrects for the wind. Let's um, just call that V sub A. That's the actual vector. So we have the vector for the plane, the vector for the wind, and then the vector, the actual vector for what's going to happen. Now, when I just did that visually to find the, the vector in green, what operation did I do with the red and the black one? that we talked about the very first day. What's that? I just added them. Okay. To, find, to find the actual vector for the plane, I took what the plane thinks it's doing, and I took the effect of the wind, and I combined them together. So visually, that's what I just did. Take what the plane is doing, take what the wind is doing, add them together, and that gives you the actual effect. Okay. So keep, keep that equation in mind. That's basically what we're going to figure out. Our goal is to find this. What is the actual vector for the plane? All right, let's start with V sub P. So I need to turn this into a velocity vector. So I need two things. I need the magnitude, and I need the angle. If I can find those two things, I can turn this into a velocity vector. Let's scroll back up. Look at V sub P. What's the magnitude of the plane? 
How fast does the plane think it's going? There's your magnitude. 500. Now, the angle, we can't say south. We need to give a number to that. What's the number we usually use when we're pointing down on the y-axis? 270. That's the angle. Okay, so the magnitude is 500. The angle is 270. Now do what you did in the homework last night. Turn that into a velocity vector. Magnitude on the outside. Cosine of the angle with an I plus sine of the angle with a J. Distribute it out and see what we get. So we've got 500 cosine 270. Zero. We don't have any horizontal component. How come the plane doesn't have any horizontal component? Yeah. Because it's going straight down. It's going exactly south. It's not going left and right at all. So the horizontal component should be zero. Now, the vertical component, it's going down, so that should be what kind of number? Should be negative, and if you do it out, you'll get negative 500. Okay, so all you really need to, well, that's your vector. If you don't put 0i, that's fine. So now you've got that. So you've got the velocity vector for the plane. Now we need to get the one for the wind. Okay, same thing again. Find the magnitude of the wind. Find the angle of the wind. Magnitude is pretty straightforward. How fast is the wind blowing? 80 miles an hour. Now the angle. Does anyone think they know what the angle is? The wind is blowing exactly northeast. Exactly. Yep. 45. It's 45. This is zero. The way we do it, north is 90, that's different than a compass, but just do it the way we've always done it. Halfway between, 45. Okay, so now let's find our velocity vector for the wind. Magnitude, cosine of the angle I, plus sine of the angle J. Now, what should happen, because it's a 45 degree angle, that's an isosceles triangle. This side and this side should be exactly the same. So whatever I get for I, I should get exactly the same number for J. 56.57. Yep, so if you do it out, you get 56.57 I plus 56.57 J. There's your velocity vector for the wind. And now to find the final effect of them, what are we going to do with the velocity vector for the plane and the wind? We're going to add them up. And that gives us our vector that's the really represents the direction of the plane and the speed of the plane. So we're going to add, if you call that box one, call that box two, add them up. Um, let me make it a little smaller. Zero I plus 56.57 I. It's just 56.57 I. Um, the next part, negative 500 plus 56.57. Okay. Negative 500. Negative. So negative 443.43. Now we have the vector that represents the actual direction the plane is going to go. You can find out whatever you want about it. 
Um, I think I said to do the magnitude and the direction. Um, let's just let's just find the speed. Okay. So in other words, I just want to know how long is that arrow in green. So we have it as a vector. What theorem would we use to find the magnitude of that? Use the Pythagorean theorem. The numbers are going to be a little bigger, um, but just find find the magnitude of it. And just use your calculator. So it's 56.57 squared. Um, we'll just call it 3200.2. And then 443.43. Point four three squared, <coughs> uh, 196,630. I forgot what I said. $96,663. So we add them up and take the square root. So let's see what we got. So plus 3200. Point two. Take the square root. So the speed of the plane is 447, roughly 447 miles per hour. And that would be the ground speed. Okay. So if you were on the ground and you pointed a radar gun at the plane, it would say the plane is going 447 miles an hour. The plane might not think that because the wind is blowing. We talked about the hand out the window thing. The wind might feel different on the plane than how fast it's actually moving. Okay, so a little bit lengthy of a problem, not overly hard, but there are a few calculations. You've got to find your two vectors and then add them up. Okay. Um, what if I said that the wind was blowing from the north? If the wind is coming from the north, which way is it blowing? South. south. The wind is coming from the north and blowing to the south. Okay. So just make sure when you read a problem, if they tell you which way the wind is blowing, like the wind is blowing south, or the wind is coming from the north. From the north means it's heading south. Does that make sense? Okay. So, what I might do on the test, I'll put one very, very similar to that. Um, the wind speed, it's going to be a very simple direction. It's either going to be northeast, northwest. It's not going to be at an angle of like 12 degrees or something weird. It'll be set up very, very similar to that. Okay, so 25 um, in the homework, it's just like the word problem we just did. Um, 7 to 17, each question has three parts. Um, I think what you're doing in 7 to 17 is you're finding the dot product, then you're finding the angle, and then you're saying whether the vectors are parallel, perpendicular, or neither. So it's not like it's three separate parts, you'd have to do all those anyway. Um, so if we have class tomorrow, which looks like we probably will, um, we'll do part four, and then the test will be on Friday. If not, we would do part five on Friday, and I would email you about whether or not we do a test this week. I'm not sure yet.